What's going on guys? This will be the first section for time series data. So in this section we're going to introduce the basics of what time series is and then we're also going to introduce two different types of models we can use for time series data. So what is time series? So time series is using past observations to predict future events. So say that these are our past observations. So our goal is going to be to form a prediction line for future observations. Now when we try to predict future events, this is known as forecasting. So throughout this chapter, we're going to learn different methods of forecasting and when to apply them. Decomposition of time series. So a time series in general can be broken down into three major parts. The first being the trend. So the trend is just going to represent the general direction that a time series takes over time. So if we look at the time series over here on the right, we can see that it's positively increasing over time. So this would represent the trend. Now we have the seasonal component. So the seasonal component represents the repeated fluctuations at equal intervals. So at equal intervals, we mean that it could have a certain fluctuation every month, every day, every hour, every year, as long as the same time of, in the same interval away. So if we were to model the seasonal component of our graph above, it would look something like this. And then finally, we have the irregular component. So the irregular components, just what's left after we subtract out our trend and our seasonal component. So it might look something like this. Now, by decomposing our series or breaking it into our three separate parts, we can then model these three components separately to try to get more accurate predictions. Additive versus multiplicative. So an additive model is what we just showed above. We took our y value at time t and it's going to be equal to our trend in time t plus our seasonal component at time t and then plus our irregular component at time t. Now we can also have a multiplicative model where at time t is going to be equal to our trend times our seasonal component times our irregular component. Now in order to make our multiplicative model additive, we're just going to take the natural log on both sides. So it's just going to be the log time t is equal to the log of our trend times our seasonal component times our error component. Now when to use an additive model and when to use a multiplicative model. So we saw above that we used an additive model. So you used an additive model when the trend remains the same over time and when the seasonal component remains the same over time. Now you're going to use a multiplicative model either when your trend changes over time, say it forms some type of quadratic increase, or your seasonal component changed over time. So say the seasonal component's increasing over time. If either of these two exists, you're going to use a multiplicative. If instead they remain the same over time, you're going to use an additive. Linear regression for time series. So we spent all last chapter talking about linear regression for regression, but you can also use linear regression to model time series data. So let's say we had observations from January 2018 to December 2020. And let's say the frequency of these observations was monthly. So this just means that every month you're going to generate a new data point. And let's say these data points represent the average sales of an outdoor retail store. So if we were to try to model this using linear regression for regression, we'd ultimately form a model that looks something like this, where we use coefficient terms, time predictors. Now, if we wanted to instead use linear regression for time series, 
we ultimately have to incorporate this time into our model somehow. So how we do that is we're going to form our time into a sequence. So for instance, January 2018th would just become 1, February 2018th would become 2, March would become 3, and then we can keep doing this until December of 2020, which would just be 24. So now we can add this to our model just like how we would a regular predictor. So we can say y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 times time. Now if we're going to make predictions off this equation, it would just form a straight line that looks something like this. So this straight line is going to represent our trend of our model. Now if you notice though, we have some fluctuations in our data that we haven't accounted to for yet. So these are just going to be the seasonal components of our model. So how do we model those? So we're going to have to add another predictor to our model. So you notice that they happen every six months. So they happen in June, December, June, and December. So since it's an outdoor retail store, this could be people buying either grass for the summer or them selling Christmas trees in the winter. So it increases their sales at that time. So how we're going to add this into the model is we can just add a month variable, which is just going to be the sequence of the months, just like how we sequence through the times of our dates. So it's just going to be January, February, March, and then it's just going to repeat until we get to the last one, which ended in December. Now to add this to the model, we would do the same way we'd add for a linear regression model, which is we'd create our dummy variables, and then one of the levels would get added to the intercept, and then we add 11 new coefficient terms. So this would just be beta 2 times if it's January, plus beta 3 if it's February, and then we can do this all the way up to beta 12 if it's November. And we can say that December would then be added to the intercept. Now the terms June and December would have larger coefficient values. So then they'll be able to accurately predict in the future so every six months, we're going to get an extra bump now for our predictions. So a seasonal component would look would just be here at six months, six months, six months, six months. And then our irregular term is just like our residuals. So it's just like what's left in our model afterwards. Now, if instead we had a quadratic term here, so you can see that's increasing over time, we could just model that just like we would again linear regression. So we can have our y value at time t is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 times t plus beta 2 times t squared. Then ultimately we could form a prediction line that followed our data. Identifying stationarity. So stationarity just means that something does not change with respect to time. So with this exam, we're mainly focused on if finding if something is weakly stationary. So if something is weakly stationary, then the expected value and variance remain the same over time. So here we have a chart of a weekly stationary process. So we can see that as time increases, our dependent variable does not change over time. It's just random. So if we were to guess an expected value, it would be the same expected value over time. We can also see that the variance remains the same over time. Now a consequence of this is that we can say the covariance between any two equal intervals so equal interval just means, say, 1 to 3 or 5 to 7. As long as these are the same width, we can say that the covariance of these two intervals is the same. Now how to test if a process is weakly stationary. 
So we just said that they have to have the same mean over time and the same variance over time. So to test if they have the same mean over time, we can use an x-bar chart. To say this is a sequence of numbers from 1 to 25. So we're going to have 25 observations, and they're going to take values 10, 12, 18. We're going to have a gap, and it's going to end with 11. Now to use an x-bar chart, we're going to divide our data into equal parts. So say every five observations. This would be one part, two parts, three parts, four parts, and then five parts. Now with an x-bar chart, the first step is to create our control limits. So we're going to have an upper control limit and a lower control limit. So the upper control limit is just going to be equal to the mean plus 3 times the standard deviation. And then our lower control limit is just going to be our mean minus 3 times our standard deviation. So for each of our intervals, we want to find the mean of the five observations in it. So say that we found the mean to be the first interval as 10. And then for the next interval, we might find the mean to be 12. And then 8, 9, and then we can say 11. So we had five intervals. So since none of these points went over our control limits, or there's no pattern in our points, we can say that our x-bar chart holds, or we can say that the mean remains the same throughout the model. Now for an R chart, we're just doing the same thing, but we're checking for the variance. So we're still going to have our upper control limit and our lower control limit. And for each of the five observations, we're going to find the standard deviation of these five observations. So we're going to find standard deviation 1, standard deviation 2, up to standard deviation 5. And then when we plot these points, they should remain in the control limits and have no type of sequence to them or clear trend. So if the plot looks like this, then we can say that it will pass both the x-bar chart and r chart. So we can say that our process is weakly stationary. Now if instead, let's say our x-bar chart looks something like this. So we have our upper control limit and our lower control limit. So even if our points remain within the interval, if they're increasing over time, like something like this, that would be the same thing as saying that the mean is increasing over time, which violates our assumption that the mean's the same over time. So we can say that this process is not weakly stationary. And then instead, if we're checking the variations of our R chart, and we had multiple points outside our intervals, then we can say that the standard deviation is not constant, so you can say again that it violates our assumption and it's not weakly stationary. White noise process. So white noise process is a stationary process that assumes our observations are IID, which just stands for independently and identically distributed. So a consequence of this is it's saying that there's no trends in our data and the observations are all independent or we can't use one observation to predict the next. So here we have an example of a white noise process. So we're going to have five observations and they're plotted over here on the right. So if we try to make a prediction from these observations, since there's no trend in our data, we would just take the mean. So a predictive value is just equal to the mean of our observations. So we can plug that in now, 10 plus 13 plus 8 plus 9 plus 10 divided by 5, and we'll get a value of 10. So this means that for any predicted value, we're going to guess a value of 10. So at time t, we would guess a value of 10, at time 15, 10, time 20, 10, so on, so on. And now we can find the standard error of our predicted values. So the standard error of our predicted values is just going to be equal to the standard error of our y value times the square root of 1 plus 1 over n. So the standard error of our y value is just going to be equal to summation of our y minus y bar squared 
divided by n minus 1, and then we're going to take the square root of that. So it's just going to be 10 minus 10 squared plus 13 minus 10 squared plus 8 minus 10 squared plus 9 minus 10 squared, and then finally 10 minus 10 squared. And then divided by m minus 1, which is just the number of observations, minus 1. And then we take the square root of this value, and we're going to get 1.871. So now to find the standard error of our predicted value, we're just going to take this number, or the standard error of y, and then times the square root of 1 plus 1 over n, which is just the number of observations, and we'll get a value of 2.05. So this means for our predicted values, the standard error is always going to be 2.05. So now that we've found how to find a predicted value, we found how to find the predicted standard error, so now we can form a prediction interval. So for the prediction interval, it's going to be our predicted value, plus or minus our t-score, and then times our standard error of our predicted value, which is just 2.05. And we already found our predicted value, which is just 10. So we just have to find our t-score. So let's say we're using 95% confidence. So this would mean that our alpha value is going to be 0.05, and then we divide it by 2 because it's a two-sided test. And then for our degrees of freedom, it's just going to be whatever we use to find our standard error. So for our white noise, we use n minus 1. So for the degrees of freedom, it's just going to be n minus 1. So 5 minus 1, so we can find this in our chart, 0 0.0254, and we get 2.7764. So now if we solve this equation, we're going to get an interval of 4.31 to 15.69. So now we can add this to the chart. So 4.31 to 15.69. So this is saying we're always going to predict a value of 10 for our future observations, and our prediction interval is always going to be the same, no matter how far ahead we're predicted, which is not going to be the case for most of the models that we're going to build with time series. But with a white noise process, we can say that the prediction interval stays the same, and our predictions are going to stay the same. So why is a white noise process important? So white noise process is important because if our irregular component simplifies to a white noise process where observations are independently and randomly distributed, then we can say we successfully modeled both the trend and seasonal component of our model. Now if instead our irregular component looks something like this, we could say we probably didn't effectively model the seasonal component, or we missed some part of our seasonal component of our model. And if instead our irregular component looks like this, we can say we probably missed some type of trend in our model. So if we're able to achieve a white noise process in our irregular component, we can say we successfully modeled our time series data. Okay, so that wraps up this section. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you next time. Thanks.